Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. Today we're going to be talking about the 4th, 5th, and 6th books in the House of Night series by PC Cast and Kristen Cass. Untamed. Hunted. And Tempted. Before we get started, I do want to put out a small spoiler alert. Some things that I talk about, also the prefaces for the 5th and 6th books, may give away things that happen in the fourth book that I'm talking about today. So just keep that in mind. So let's start with the fourth book, Untamed. Untamed was published September 23rd of 2008. It is 338 pages and it rates 3.95 stars with 212,000 ratings, 83,000 being five star and 6,000 being one star. And here's the preface. Life sucks when your friends are pissed at you. Just ask Zoe Redbird. She's become an expert on suckiness. In one week, she has gone from having three boyfriends to having none, and from having a close group of friends who trusted and supported her to being an outcast. Speaking of friends, of the two Zoe has left, one is undead and one is unmarked. Neferet has declared war on humans, which Zoe knows in her heart is wrong, but will anyone listen to her? Zoe's adventures at Vampire Finishing School take a wild and dangerous turn as loyalties are tested, shocking true intentions come to light, and ancient evil is awakened in PC and Kristen Cass' spellbinding fourth House of Night novel. Next is Hunted. Hunted was published March 10th of 2009. It rates a 3.93 stars with 161,000 ratings. 62,000 being 5 star and 4,000 being 1 star and it is 323 pages. Zoe's friends have her back again and Stevie Ray and the Red Fledglings aren't Neferet's secrets any longer. But an unexpected danger has emerged. Neferet guards her powerful new consort, Canola, and no one at the House of Night seems to understand the threat he possesses. Canola is gorgeous and he has the House of Night under his spell. A past life holds the key to breaking his rapidly spreading influence, but what if this past life unearths secret Zoe doesn't want to see and truth she can't face? On the run and hold up in Tulsa's Prohibition era tunnels, Zoe and her gang must discover a way to deal with something that might bring them all down. Meanwhile, Zoe has a few other problems. The red fledglings have cleaned up well. They've even managed to make the dark, creepy tunnels feel more like a home. But are they really as friendly as they seem? On the boyfriend front, Zoe has had a chance to make things right with her super hot ex, Eric. But she can't stop thinking about Stark, the archer who died in her arms after one unforgettable night. And she is driven to try and save him from Neferet's sinister influence and all, at all costs. Will anyone believe the power evil has to hide among us? And last is Tempted. Tempted was published October 23rd of 2009. It's 319 pages and rates a 3.95 stars with 151,000 ratings, 60,000 being 5 star and 4,000 being 1 star. Dark secrets and unspoken suspicions come between Zoe and Stevie Ray, putting their friendship and the House of Night at risk. After Zoe Redbird and her gang have banished Canola and Neferet from Tulsa, you'd think they'd catch a break. But with Zoe and her sexy warrior Stark both recovering from a brush with death, and the fledgling struggling to deal with the fallout from Neferet's reign of terror, a break is not just in the forecast. Zoe is haunted by her confusing yet elemental connection with Aya, the ancient Cherokee maiden who was the only human able to tempt Canola's body and soul. How will A.S. pull on her affect Zoe's ability to resist the dangerous, seductive, immortal? Meanwhile, Stevie Ray, with her super red vamp powers, always thought she could handle stuff she's been keeping from her BFF. But the mysterious, threatening force lurking in the tunnels under the Tulsa Depot is spreading. Stevie Ray won't confide where she's been and what she's doing, and Zoe is beginning to wonder how much she can trust the person she always thought would have her back. Will their choices destroy them, and will darkness consume the House of Night? Find out in this next spectacular installment in the best-selling House of Night series. So let's get into it. Now, as you can probably tell from the prefaces, the shit has kind of really hit the fan during these three books or poopy, as Zoe would say. Now, 
you know, there's nothing wrong with someone not wanting to cuss, even though she says hell a lot. There's nothing wrong with not cussing, but you can be a little bit more adult and use grown up words rather than poopy instead of shit. But that's just me. So the story itself has kind of gone off kilter a little bit because their goddess Nyx is a Greek goddess. And now Neferet has unleashed Kelowna, who is from Cherokee legend, which Zoe and her grandma are Cherokee, which is like so very specific because it's like you have the House of Night, which is based in Tulsa, but people come from all over the place to come to this House of Night. And just specifically, Neferet unleashes Kelowna, which just happened to be a Cherokee legend, and Zoe and her grandma are Cherokee. The only Cherokee people, she don't even consider herself Cherokee. Well, she does. She says her Cherokee people. Well, no. She says her grandma's Cherokee people. So, she might not even consider herself being a Cherokee, but her grandma's Cherokee. So now you have Greek goddess mixed with Cherokee. And then Zoe gets into a like nonprofit thing, the Street Cats of Tulsa. And the Street Cats are run by nuns. And she uses this as a way to try and get the House of Night out into the world a little bit and try and up their reputation a little bit. The main nun, Sister Mary Angela, she is a quote unstereotypical nun, which means that according to Zoe and herself, that Ninx is just another face of the Virgin Mary, which I think is a, just a complete stretch. So now you have three different beliefs or mythologies. Obviously, Nix and Kelowna would probably be considered mythology, while Virgin Mary and stuff would be more of a belief. Um, now you have these three mixing. And if it was done correctly, it would probably be a little bit better. But they're just kind of throwing stuff in here now. It's like some weird belief soup that they got going on right now. And so now Kelowna's been released and him and Nefered have taken over the House of Night. And it's like, which they, they've started using Aphrodite. Aphrodite has visions. They're starting to use Aphrodite's visions as new, more elaborative plot points. Like she starts having these visions about Zoe dying, about her grandma dying, and now about this creature that's been lifted. And this is not the only time this happens either. You know, every time a new plot point comes along, it's Aphrodite's vision that kind of kick starts the idea. There's a, there's a new kid that comes to the House of Night named Stark, and he is a special kind of warrior from another school, another House of Night, and he gets moved to the, to the uh, Tulsa House of Night. And after all, it, it's like you completely know how the story goes, because you, we've just went through this whole you know, Neferet was the reason why the fledglings that were dying were coming back to life and becoming the red fledglings and all this other stuff. And then suddenly Stark comes. And, you know, he's this super bad, badass warrior who can't miss with his bow. And every time he shoots, it always hits its mark and all this other stuff. You know he's going to die. Like, Neferet and all this other stuff, you know, she... You're, you're in the middle of a war and suddenly Stark comes. You know he's going to die. And he does. Spoiler alert. He does. So then Zoe meets him for the first time and is automatically just completely fallen in love with him. Says they're soulmates and all this other stuff. And which 
definitely you know by then he's gonna die. So like after like the second chapter and the second time talking to him he dies. No surprise there. And then so he dies so she's dealing with the after fact of that. Zoe and Lauren ended up going to bed together. She loses her virginity to him which again like I said in the last video I think is highly inappropriate. Eric actually catches them. So when Eric catches them together he breaks up with her and after he breaks up with her he actually turns into a full vampire. Now and this is not very tasteful at all but after Lauren Blake dies who he was the poetry teacher Eric actually is asked to take over his class so now Eric's a teacher and of course Zoe has Eric's class so their first class together they do this whole skit together and he tries to pick on her as a teacher and brings her up and they do this whole skit together and by the end of it he's choking her well as a part of the skit of the play that they were doing he started choking her and then they started making out in front of the whole class that's nasty and then so after this all starts getting kick started and once Kelowna is released from the earth Stark comes back we all knew he would Stark comes back and Stark well all, all the kids go away to the tunnels for a while and then they have to come back to the house of night when they come back to the house of night everyone's entranced over Kelowna and all this other stuff and Stark is pretty much going around and doing whatever the hell he wants. Now he attempts to actually rape one of the girls. He backs her into the corner and after she tells him no he bites her anyway and once you bite it turns very sensual and all that other stuff. So he forces to bite her and then he attempts to rape her while he's drinking from her and Zoe and Darius who Darius is the warrior that Aphrodite actually falls in love with and when Kelowna is risen he's one of the only warriors that doesn't have any kind of effect off of Kelowna so he actually goes with the the kids to the tunnels under the depot um, Zoe and Darius get Stark away from the girl that he was attempting to rape. And after that, there is no consequences whatsoever to Stark about what happened. Now, the girl's name was Becca, and Zoe actually meets Becca afterwards, and Becca is like, you know, oh, you shouldn't have stopped us, and she's like, I helped you, you know helped you from being raped and all this other stuff and Becca St Stark as a red vampire can mess with her mind so he messed with her mind so she wouldn't think of it as being raped and still Zoe cannot help the fact to be pissed off at Becca by what she's saying and then later on in the books Stark gets her his humanity back but there's still no consequences to the fact even when her Zoe's friends hold him accountable until he gets his humanity back and then he does get his humanity back it's all okay after that like there's no remorse for it at all which apparently there's no remorse for anything there's no remorse for rape there's no remorse for murder there's no remorse for any kind of student teacher relationship that shouldn't have went on at all there's that and then we have Carmesha. Now Carmesha is a red vampire that is introduced in Stevie Ray's circle who also gets her uh, humanity back. 
But then we go back to the black stereotypes, which her character just is portrayed almost like straight out of the ghetto the way she talks and she talks like that she talks like she's highly uneducated and it's it's annoying for one thing because no one else in this book so far that you have to like concentrate on what they're saying to s figure out what they're saying like no one else has any kind of accent like that so it's like she's you know in her own little circle of like weirdness or whatever just goes back to the black stereotypes from the first three books and then Zoe magically finds out that she is a reincarnation of Aya and Aya is a maiden that was made from the earth by her grandmother's ancestors to entrap Kelowna in the earth. So she is a reincarnation of that, of that soul. So now she's automatically drawn to Kelowna and in many dreams, they embrace, they kiss, and all that stuff, which is another thing because Kelowna has a flock of what they call raven mockers, which is from him raping and pillaging his or Zoe's grandmother's people, and they had these children that were the raven mockers, which were half man and half raven bird. And in one of the scenes where Zoe has kind of went back in time and become Aya again, she sees Aya and Kelowna down in the earth and, you know, he's like, you trapped me or whatever. And she was like, you were never made for this earth and you were once a warrior and you're my warrior and, you know, blah, blah, blah. It just goes back to it's okay to rape and pillage and there's no consequences for anything. So the these books are a little bit more far-fetched than the first three books. And one thing I do like is that in the uh, sixth book, Intempted, um, they actually start doing a split narrative, mostly between Zoe and Stevie Ray, which does help with the story. And it's nice to have a new perspective on what is going on. And then, of course, Stevie Ray falls in love with a raven mocker because, you know, why not? So that's about it for these three books. Like I said in my last one, what is propelling me forward with these books is mostly blatant curiosity to see how it ends but the story itself while it's kind of interesting to see the different mythologies and you know I don't really know anything about the Cherokee people so kind of getting a little bit of taste of that and stuff like that is kind of interesting it it's a lot of repetitiveness um a lot of what happens in the books like the ha first half of the book is explaining what happened in the last book and that goes back to the repetitiveness of the describing the characters and all that stuff you know the actual story itself in each book is like half the book is what happened in the last book and like i said in the last video you know, people don't normally just pick up a random book out of a series and start reading it. You you read it in order. That's why it's a series. They're all connected. And these books only happen like a couple of days apart from each other. So you, you read these books and it's like half the book is what you already read. So that's kind of annoying too. But I'm, I'm still, I'm still trucking through. Um, I want to know how it ends. I'm invested this far. I'm going to go all the way. But 
there's a lot of annoying stuff that goes on. And I don't know if it is on purpose because, you know, these are just still stupid 17 year old teenagers or if it's not on purpose let me let me know what you guys think so that's all i got for today um uh as soon as i'm done with the ninth book i'm gonna do my next video and then i'm gonna take a break from the house tonight a little bit um but that's all i have for right now so thank you so much for watching and i'll see you guys next time bye